Hello, this is Logan Chipkin, and you're listening to the Fallible Animals Podcast. Today I speak with Carlos de la Guardia. Carlos is an amateur artificial intelligence researcher and a musician with a longtime interest in Karl Popper and David Deutsch. He and I discussed how one can apply the philosophy of critical rationalism and some of David Deutsch's ideas to real life, so to speak. How should one act, given that problems are inevitable and that life is literally unpredictable? Are there any guiding principles at all under such conditions? I had fun picking Carlos's brains about this and other topics, including how critical rationalism may help us to have more productive disagreements, effective altruism, and the universal constructor. You can follow Carlos on Twitter at Della3499. That's D-E-L-A-3499. I now give you Carlos de la Guardia. All right, I'm here with Carlos de la Guardia. Carlos, did I pronounce your name well enough? Yeah, Guardia, perhaps, uh, more than Guardia, but yeah. All right, well, for next time, I'll, I'll know. Mm-hmm. So how are you today? How was your Thanksgiving? All good. Good, good, good to hear. You even read a bit keep, of Popper, keep, so. You read some Popper? Yeah. Which uh, book? I just read one of the essays from the Popper Selections, the uh, compilation from Miller, David Miller. Okay, I've actually also been reading Popper's essays here and there lately, and I've noticed it's hard for me to keep track of which essay is original because I think some of them, or at least the concepts, he writes about repeatedly. So in Objective Knowledge, he has a bunch of essays, and then in The Myth of the Framework, he has a bunch of essays, and it all sort of blends, with the exception of The Logic of Scientific Discovery, that was an actual book unto itself. And then after that, it just seems like a lot of the work that I see of his is a bunch of essays. Yeah, his books are sort of a compendium a lot of times, yeah. I've been noticing that. I must say, I still, from what I can recall of his writings, I think I enjoy the logic of scientific discovery the most because I think most of his essays, I think a lot of his essays actually explicitly correspond to lectures that he gives to non-specialists. And so I think they are written in a way that's more palatable for the non-academic, but I still enjoy the logic of scientific discovery the most. Sure, yeah. So on the podcast, I've been spending a fair amount of time outlining the basics of critical rationalism, the basic tenets of this philosophy of epistemology, this theory of knowledge and how it grows and how we acquire it and so forth. And I mentioned once or twice in early episodes of the podcast that critical rationalism It's not just a philosophy of science or knowledge. It's also, even more generally, a philosophy of problem solving. But I've really only been focusing on the scientific aspects of that. So I was hoping today you and I could chat, because I know you have given a lot of thought to how critical rationalism applies to problem solving in life. And that's something, frankly, that I don't spend a lot of time thinking about. So I was wondering if you could give me and my audience some of your thoughts on the matter. How does that sound? Sounds good. So in general... If someone is just being introduced to critical rationalism and they're not at all interested in how it applies to science, which is probably a large fraction of the population, how would you sell critical rationalism in the sense of how would they apply it to problems in their own life? Sure. So I think that as a philosophy of knowledge and the growth of knowledge, the creation of knowledge, Popper did speak specifically about science, but you know, I personally have thought about it in the context of artificial general intelligence, which is something that Also, David Deutsch has talked about. So wherever there is knowledge creation going on um, and problem solving going on, Popper is relevant, potentially, at least at sort of a fundamental level. In some cases, it's the sort of thing where, you know, fundamental physics, let's say, isn't always relevant to your daily life, even if it's true about what's going on. So, you know, updates in physics don't necessarily change, you know, what cheese you put on your sandwich or whatever. So it's not a given that these things will have a practical value. But I think Popper does. Like I said, in any place where there's problem solving going on, there's a potential for relevance. So not only in science, but also politics. And I think also in personal life. And, you know, one small example of that, or maybe even not even small, but is the idea of ignorance generally. And so when you think of 
making decisions in your personal life, ignorance plays quite a big role. Specifically, let's say if you're going to plan your career, then or, or if, if you're thinking of such a thing, I'll put it in square quotes, uh, scare quotes, uh, planning your career, then you have to realize you're fallible and there's all, all sorts of things you don't know that will affect your happiness in some future career, let's say. And so if you think I'll go to school for however many years in the hopes that once I leave, I'll have a degree and be in a career path that I'll enjoy, you should recognize that you may not enjoy that once you get there. So for instance, uh, you should not try to do that um, preparatory work in, a, you know, in college, let's say, if you do hate it, because the future reward you are planning to get may never materialize. You are fallible about what you will enjoy in 10 years time. So sacrificing everything now for that future date doesn't make much sense in that, in that context. That's like one example of decision making under uncertainty, which I think falls straight out of the idea that you could be wrong about anything at any time, and your own desires in the future are a prime example. Two things came to mind while you were speaking. One is that so much of our culture, I think, venerates doing things even though you hate them, as if it's such a virtue. You know, so-and-so, he works so hard even though it makes him miserable. Wow, what a great person. Whereas you seem to imply that, in fact, it's not a virtue at all to do something despite the fact that you hate it. The theory goes that uh, you sacrifice now for the future reward later, but if the future reward is potentially, there's a risk it won't ever be there, then the risk may be for nothing. Suffering may be for nothing. Whereas if you view that the future reward is certain, you know, like you will definitely get this career, not only will you get the job, but enjoy it, then maybe you can make an argument for saying, well, the benefits in the future outweigh the costs now. But when you recognize the uncertainty and ignorance you have about the future, the calculus of that decision making changes. Right. And so this connects also to Deutsch's work on planning for an unforeseeable future, a future that is inherently not deterministic. Namely, we can't even predict the future state of what our problems will be in our own lives. And more than that, every individual's environment itself contains other creative minds that are themselves unpredictable. So there's really no getting around the fact that creativity is required in life to solve problems or progress or pursue goals in any way. Yeah, it's a surprise that, you know, so, so one of the things that I found really fascinating and sort of evocative when I read David's book, The Beginning of Infinity, was that he's got a, a section on the difference between cultures which make progress and those that don't, which you call static and dynamic societies. And so when I read that, he, there's a good sentence in there that says, you know, we're only partially, our culture makes much more progress, vastly more progress than our ancestors did. But still, we're only partly sort of evolved from those cultures. You know, there's still all sorts of things about how we treat ideas that don't promote progress. They promote things staying the same. And so the idea of an authority which can tell you which scientific theories are true or whatever, whatever that kind of thing or some kind of religious document is one thing. But also the idea of career paths are kind of like that. that. They say that there's a defined way of be, you know, being young and growing old and, and making money and how you do it. I and mean, it involves going up some kind of specific career ladder. And that that is already known. The, you need not think about how to change or that your path would be different than that. So it's another way, with a subtler way, I suppose, in which you assume things won't change and that you won't have to make your own decisions and come up with new ideas. So I think that this focus on new ideas being necessary is really interesting. And whenever I read that chapter, I remember thinking, yeah, I wonder what all these specific examples are of how our culture is only still partially evolved from our static society ancestors who never changed. And so, yeah, I'm always looking for examples of that kind of thing and then trying to get around them. Yes, I think that's possibly my favorite chapter of the entire book. I was actually, I want to get around to rereading it very soon because I haven't read it in a, in a little while and I feel like now I have a slightly more mature perspective maybe than I had last time I'd read it. But I remember thinking when I did read that, similar to what you were thinking, I basically thought, wow, what are the sort of static memes out there in our culture, in, our, in the memo sphere, as it were, of our culture that... I'm not even aware of that are holding me down or holding other people down that they're not even aware of. And it's it's almost a fun game, but it's more than a game because it has it has real applications for prosperity and, and creativity in society. And I think you mentioned, you know, religious dogmas, but those are almost the more obvious ones. To me, what's fun is discovering ones that aren't obvious to everyone. So, for example, certain cultural dogmas that behave like religions, but that don't wear traditional religious garb as it were and then also i think there are static memes when it comes to supposed or purported knowledge growth itself so i think what i like to call the authority by mathematics where i think a lot of and you'll see this in different schools of thought in academia where 
it's almost like the more math you have in a given academic paper, the more progress you're making in terms of problem solving. But that's a total non sequitur in the first place. So those are just two examples that I thought of, but I'm sure there's maybe an infinite number that I'm not even aware of. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I um, necessarily focus too much on, on memes or whatever, but it does seem like there are these assumptions we have in the background that work against us. So whether those are memes or not, I don't know. But there, there seems to be like a picture of how the world works and how life should be that is sometimes just sort of assumes that certain things won't change. It's odd, but like uh, I don't necessarily find myself thinking at a gut level that the next 10 years will be different. And whenever I think about it in these terms, you know, will there be progress in the next 10 years or something? It seems ob obvious to me that, you know, yes. And yet the idea that like the things I will care about in 10 years will be very different, it seems sort of foreign. And there's another good sentence from uh, Beginning of Infinity that says something like, you know, you can't let the idea that sort of new ideas will, will not exist condition your planning. The idea that you won't create new ideas or that progress won't occur. And so I think that that's uh, sort of in the background of how I think about the world that, oh yeah, things will be the same more or less, but they won't be, or we should hope they won't be. So just trying to get that into my head in a way that really works, that I, I can actually sort of feel that sense of progress is going to be made and that it will actually define many of the decisions that I'll be making. It's hard to do. Yeah, it is hard to do. I think one reason it's hard is because psychologically, or even maybe physically, it's literally impossible to predict future knowledge. And so it's almost easier to just project the present moment into the future. Whereas, like you're saying, that's, well, hopefully that's not the case. And it, well, in fact, it's impossible in many other ways. And moreover, it's it's funny because we live now in 2019 in arguably the age in which technology and ideas are progressing at a faster rate than ever, and we're recording all of it. So, I mean, if you watch, I always use this as an example, if you watch a movie from literally 10 years ago, you can tell that it's not current because they're using flip phones and stuff like that. And so the evidence of the growth of knowledge has never been more abundant for us. And yet still, there's this idea that things will never change, this in intuition, as you were implying it is, that things won't change. Yeah, like you said, uh, you, you can't predict the details, but there are certain aspects, like I mentioned earlier about the career planning idea, the idea that you, the, the idea that taking a particular script of how your career should evolve seems like a bad idea when things are changing so rapidly. And yet that idea seems kind of normal, and that perhaps it shouldn't. Um, certain things perhaps you can plan, but broadly speaking, not. So that's one idea that should probably seem weirder than it does in the context of rapid change, this idea of planning your career ahead of time. So what should people do then as they grow into adulthood to plan for this unpredictable future, this inherently unpredictable future? Well, I guess sort of the idea is that you don't necessarily or like the well i guess the question is sort of funny in a way because i guess the, the real answer is that there is no answer or that there isn't a way to plan for that kind of thing um, it's more saying what will be required in the sense of saying like yeah new ideas will be required <laughs> i guess sort of waving my hands as i say this and yeah i think that's sort of the point it's, it's to say that you know, if you ask me what should i how should I approach the next 10 years? The point isn't that I'll have an answer. The point is sort of that I'm saying, like, there's no way to answer that question in an itemized list. It's rather that, like, you will have to think of new ideas along the way because uh, your mind will be changing as you learn things. And it's worth bearing in mind that most of the existing opportunities in the world, things that you would enjoy doing, you don't know about yet and will only discover in the course of doing other things. So, not you know, not only can I not specify what you'll be doing, like, you can't now specify what you'd enjoy in the future at any level of detail. And that's going to emerge from what you think about. And that's not to even mention the fact that most of the fun things to do haven't been invented yet. <laughs> so of the existing things, you know very little of them, and that's true of everybody. And then other things which are possible, few of them are known by anybody and won't be for some time. So all that is to say that uh, everything that comes down the pike the next 10 years, whether it's something you learn about because uh, you know other people know it, or because they're discovered anew. You know you're gonna have to make a decision at those times. You know it, when some new thing like YouTube comes out, the idea of being a YouTuber is now a possibility where it wasn't before. And so any prior career plan won't have taken that into account, and the possible income streams that might provide, and you know the lifestyle you could have as a result. You know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the answer to yeah, how do I approach the next ten years is sort of make your own uh, creatively. Creatively, I suppose, <laughs> is, the, is the adjective you would have to use. I was going to respond by saying sort of a combination of Deutsch's maxim that problems are inevitable, 
but also problems are soluble. So I guess the two, the pair of maxims. And then also creativity will always be required. Life cannot be just an algorithm that you execute. Yeah. By the way, uh, just before I forget, um, I, I, I like the book, uh, Peter Thiel's book, uh, Zero to One. He's a Silicon Valley investor and very interested in startups. And he, I think, has ex expressed some uh, distaste at the lack of progress uh, that in, in his mind that he's seen. And I think that uh, the motto for his investing company is something like, um, you know, we were promised flying cars and what we got was 140 characters. So I guess he's not too pleased with Twitter, but uh, whereas I am, but nevertheless, yes. Yeah, so so, so he, he's had sort of has tried to think about well, how do people approach making businesses that are actually consequential and so on and uh, have a high ambition. And so I think his book Zero to One is sort of the uh, business equivalent in a way of the beginning of infinity. So if you look, if you stare closely at their titles, you sort of see a similarity in a way. Zero to one is kind of a beginning of infinity. And he, he makes various points about, about how yeah new ideas are required and not only that, are available everywhere. And so we should seek them. Or hopefully they're, they're available everywhere. Uh, I think a nightmare scenario would be a society in which literally all individuals have the same thoughts, or at least any novelty of thought is suppressed by some, some form of tyranny, whether that's cultural or political. Uh, yeah, I mean, in his case, I think he diagnoses the situation that he's interested in, sort of the business situation, as being one where people just don't have that much ambition or don't think it's possible. So so maybe there is something, like you say, working in the background there that limits people's thinking. I, I guess you just call it broadly pessimism or just not, not imagining enough, perhaps, you know. And so, or maybe not taking the idea that problems are soluble. Seriously. So if you see a problem, you think, oh, you know, somebody else will solve that in the future or, you know, it's too hard for me to work on now, so I won't work on it. I know Elon Musk has also been asked the question, you know, like, how, how do you run so many companies? And, you know, what's going on there? And, and not in a sense of literally how do you run them, but more like, you know, how did you get the idea that you could do that? Like, how is it possible that somebody can, can do these things? And his view seemed to be that, you know, most people take an arbitrarily low view of what they can do. And, you know, he's often told things are impossible by engineers or something, uh, at least by other companies, uh, not the ones he runs, maybe. But he, he's always curious to hear, well, why is this impossible? <laughs> Can you explain to me why such and such is impossible? And if you can't explain why it's impossible, you know, with reference to physics or something rather, then let's try it. You know, there's an obvious reason why it should, you know, shouldn't be impossible, even if no one has done it before. Like that can't be the argument for why it's impossible, simply that no one has done it. And so I think all these things come together to say that you know, whether you're Elon Musk or Peter Thiel looking for, you know, more ambitious startups. Yeah, the idea is that, as you say, these problems are soluble, and so you should try to solve them, however big they are. Yes, I agree. And Deutsch's principle, and really it's a, it follows from constructor theory, but it applies to life in general. And in a sense, it's the sequel to Popper's optimism, actually, because Popper also wrote about optimism, is that problems are soluble, as you said, provided that the solution is not forbidden by the laws of nature or the laws of physics. I like to say laws of nature, but anyway. And so that really is a life-changing statement once you really swallow it. And I remember I heard Deutsch in an interview one time and he said, you know, my, he said something along the lines of, my intuition told me that there must be a third option. And yet when you just look at the logic of it, that it's either something's forbidden by the laws of physics or it's possible given the knowledge of how to execute it. And it's an amazing thing. And so it's fun to see business people like Peter Thiel or Elon Musk, and I don't know if either one has read Deutsch, but to see different precursors, different optimistic precursors hint and flirt with this principle, either consciously or not. Hopefully one day, you know, there will be, everyone on earth will know the principle and we'll have billions or trillions of optimists in the universe. Yeah. And just to tag one other uh, person I'm in that list of uh, sort of business people and so on, seem to be optimistic. Jeff Bezos, you know, that I've seen him, I guess, give some talks I heard he has some uh, very good shareholder letters and things like that to uh, various people in the company. But uh, he's also given talks where I know he's mentioned this idea of like day one thinking, I guess is the name for it within the company. And that seems very much like the beginning of infinity in the sense that he's saying, you know, we're always at the beginning as a company. And he views the history of many companies as great ideas at the beginning, which are then applied. And then after some time of success, uh, no new ideas are really being created or no, no bold ones, at least only sort of incremental changes to the existing products that, and so on. Whereas the idea of Amazon itself and selling books and all these things was this bold new idea. And that was a very transformative idea. And so my impression from what uh, he's trying to get out of this term, day one thinking, is that we want more of those ideas, the ones that began this whole company, not just 
the you know incremental improvements that they want those too. So it's sort of an, an evocative title for saying, okay, well, let's not be held back by previous successes and stay in a particular lane, but also try to think of bold new ideas as well. I like that a lot. I never thought of it that way. But but in a sense, it's true because your past solving of problems, whether we're looking at civilization as a whole throughout time or one person's life or the life history of a company, your past successes gives no indication of what you ought to do in the future in terms of solving the problems in front of you now. Well, I think the thing that happens is that if you know you can make a small improvement now, uh, sort of along the lines of what you've already done, it's probably a very good thing to do. And yet, there's also other kinds of thinking you can do that are a bit more novel and unrelated, you know, in some sense, to what you've already done. So I think that, yeah, the point he's making is just that uh, not, not to give in to the temptation of focusing only on those things which are less speculative. So I think this is also a point that Peter Thiel makes about startups and things where he says that you should try to... Um, this is advice for investors, I suppose, but it has to do with the idea of having a portfolio of companies that you invest in that any one of which could pay you back for all the companies you invested in. Like you could, if you're going to invest in 10 companies, the idea is that if all of them fail except one, that one will get the, the benefits, uh, the returns for, from that one company will make your whole endeavor of investing in 10 companies worth it. So only one has to succeed if that's a big enough success. And so that, that idea of sort of going for something big and, and somewhat risky is something that is a, evidently not the kind of thing uh, that is pursued by a large company, which has a lot to lose. Uh, there's a reason why they don't want to take big risks. If they have, you know, a big company, you, you don't want to do something that destroys it. So in practice, doing something like Bezos recommends, uh, you know, requires not saying things like we're going to bet the whole company on this or that and take a huge risk in that sense, but in the sense of saying like, you know, we, we can do new things without risking all the good things we've already created. So that's an important detail as well. And that important detail directly contradicts any theory that wealth is a fixed pie, which we, I, or at least I see a lot of these days. Yeah, I don't know if he's thinking in those terms specifically, but um, certainly he's trying to contribute to progress and saying that it's not just about expanding uh, what we've already done, but creating new things. And so I think that that's another theme and Peter Thiel's zero to one, he sort of contrasts two modes of progress, one of which he calls sort of vertical and horizontal, stuff like that. And so one of the ideas is that you, once you've created something, can try to get it out to as many people as possible. And so let's say if an American company, uh, let's say, so yeah, somebody starts Twitter in the US, but it's not in other countries. So maybe somebody in Spain starts their own version of Twitter. In his parlance, that'd be horizontal progress, maybe. He says, you know, the, the initial creation of Twitter would be zero to one in his terminology. You know, it didn't exist anywhere, and then it did. Uh, so that's really new. And then it's also good, but a different thing to say, ah, well, that, that was a successful idea in this particular area in the US. So let's do the same thing elsewhere. Uh, so that's also a good thing, but a different thing. And so I think that's similar to what you mentioned there, that it's, it's not just about spreading things. Let's say the fixed pie of all the population who has access to something like Twitter. So it's not just about growing that because that will eventually come to a, a, a stop once you've hit everybody. Um, there's only so much work to be done in spreading an idea. At some point, you have to create new ones. It's interesting how critical rationalism and notions of wealth and creativity and freedom all dovetail very beautifully into a sort of a framework of how one ought to live one's life given the inevitability of problems. So why don't we switch gears a little bit from talking about how critical rationalism applies to problem solving on sort of a personal level and switch a little bit to something else that's been on my mind, which is how could someone take critical rationalism or the tools of critical rationalism and apply them to the art of argumentation? In other words, I think especially these days, or maybe not, it could be an illusion that, that the quality of argumentation is degrading. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether or not critical rationalism could help us to improve the quality of conversation. Interesting. Yeah, I think that I was talking with, uh, with a friend about this at one point. Uh, we went to a, uh, a, like a, some kind of family lunch, and some topic came up that was sort of political. And <laughs> so he's not from the U.S., and he said that as soon as I brought up the topic and appeared to have something like the wrong opinion on it, you know, <laughs> this is this being like the first half sentence of the topic, <laughs> uh, that um, everybody at the table thought, dumb American. 
he's, he's like, that's what they were thinking. They, they were pleasant at first, at least. And they were, you know, starting to get more riled up <laughs> as you kept going. But he said, as soon as you broached the topic in a certain way, was, I, I could tell they were thinking, this guy is a dumb American. And the, the interesting thing is that he's also not American, you know, it's, but has a very different attitude towards conversation. So rather than being dismissive in that way, would sort of be curious. And I think that I, I've always found that ever since high school, I didn't realize it at the time, but I really enjoyed just arguing in, in the fun sense of conversation. Like uh, it would be fun for me. And I can recall a time when there was just a break in class and there was nothing going on. And so something like somebody said to me about black holes, I think. <laughs> and, and none of us knows much about black holes. You know, keep in mind, this is very much... <laughs> people arguing kind of nonsense, but nevertheless, we, we knew a couple of things. And so somebody would say something and then it was fun to try to figure out where they might be wrong and say, oh, but what about this? If they're going this much, this speed, then that wouldn't work. And guy says, okay, well, you got me there, but what about this? You know, and I was going back and forth was just really fun. And that was my experience of it. Whereas this experience at the lunch table uh, wasn't that way. Like even if I was trying to approach it that way, people sort of just viewed it whatever my opinion was, it's just wrong and, you know, something to be shot down or, you know, it wasn't in that spirit of fun. So I think that that's sort of one of the big uh, things for me is saying, well, you know, conversation should be fun, <laughs> hopefully. And, you know, Popper has more to say about that in the sense of saying that you should always approach a conversation with the idea that you might learn something, you know, you're both wrong, very likely on some things. So see what you can learn. But I think, yeah, that just the idea that you can learn something in conversation and have fun doing it is, is the approach to take. And it's funny, I you and I seem to maybe share this quality. I've always enjoyed just talking about ideas with people and I've always been a curious person. And I remember when I was maybe 22 or so, I was in the corporate world and I was learning economics and slowly becoming a radical libertarian that I am today. And I would have these conversations with a, not a coworker, but someone who sat near my desk. We would talk politics and we would talk economics and so forth. And the more libertarian, it was literally while I was reading David Friedman's The Machinery of Freedom, if you know that book, but he's, mm -hmm. he's an anarcho-capitalist. And the more libertarian I became, the more he kept implying that I was a morally corrupt person. And <laughs> okay. it was just very, it was very confusing to me because I thought we were just having fun talking about ideas. And then he just got, it got worse and worse. Like he would say, Logan, I know deep, deep down you're a good person. That's, he eventually said that to me. And I remember uh, analogizing it to... It's like I thought we were playing basketball one on one, both having fun, and then you just punch me in the privates while we're playing. It's like, what are you doing? I thought we were having fun because at one point he got sort of very hostile. Okay. So it was very, in other words, he and I had different goals when we were talking. I was curious because I was totally new to a completely new way of thinking, and I was bouncing ideas off him. But he, I suppose, was on some kind of moral crusade, and I was the enemy. <laughs> and, and by the way, you said that he at one point had to say to you. I know you're good deep down. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the kind of compliment that is, uh, is, uh, doesn't serve the intent or yeah, it's not a compliment, but not really. I once got one no, of those. It's not, it wasn't a compliment at all. He was saying, he was basically saying, because, and by the way, this was my first, I didn't know that libertarians received this sort of hostility from non-libertarians. So this was my first encounter. He was saying that because of my quote unquote politics, therefore I was morally deficient. But that deep down, I actually cared. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I'm the same. I was the same guy that I was, you know, a few months ago before I was a libertarian. But he could never countenance that possibility because that would require. That's what I'm saying is that that would require him to reflect on his ideas. Sure. It was an extremely revealing experience. I remember, by the way, it, it, you know, getting a compliment that wasn't a compliment one time when I went to like a uh, <laughs> to a store and somebody complimented me. They said, "You speak very good English." <laughs> I, thought, I, I have i said thank you but i, I really don't know how to interpret that <laughs> yeah that's hilarious well to be honest it could have been that you because you are a good speaker you are very articulate you know it, there it might not have been an ethnic connotation to no, be fair. I, Although, I, I don't know. in the context there definitely was it was sort of like you know you oh, speak okay. you know your your english is really good <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> as if you know it's a surprise it probably shouldn't be like uh, i didn't expect that it would be so yeah <laughs> By the way, um, I mean, th those kinds of comments, uh, you know, you're good deep down. You speak English really well, you know, parenthetically, for someone who doesn't know how to speak English, very, you know, 
presumably didn't learn to speak English originally as their first language. Uh, this thing comes up as well with things like, you're a girl, you can also be a scientist. This idea, like in each of these cases, the starting point is something other than what is explicitly stated. So when they say, you're good, Logan, they're saying, you appear very bad, but deep down, there's something good about you. And they say, you're good at English, Carlos, this as well. You know, I assume you were bad, but you're surprisingly <laughs> good for what I had assumed. If you're saying, you're a girl, you can also be a scientist. It's sort of the assumption that, oh, you, normally I would say no, or, you know, it would have been assumed <laughs> no, you know, or culturally or something. Uh, but in fact, that's wrong, you know, uh, as opposed to saying in each case, you know, <laughs> do, do what you want to do. You know, Logan, in our conversation, there probably won't be a need for me to compliment your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is oh you're you're not a serial killer. I said what? No, I, I, yeah. no I, I completely agree, and I actually think there's a lot of that sort of a lot of those I call them memes that maybe you don't like. Maybe I use memes more loosely than you do, but there are a lot of those floating around in our society where it's like, oh, you're such and such demographic, but still you can do this. It's like, yeah, but we're already all universal explainers, so we already can do whatever we want, provided we figure out how to do it. It doesn't matter what color or gender we are. (laughs) Right, exactly. Who said I couldn't? But it's crazy that, and this is another thing, that that cultural idea of basically patting someone on the head and telling them that they can do it despite their immutable characteristics, that's perceived as virtuous. And that's what worries me right now. Yeah, just to say one other example, I was watching a uh, podcast with a comedian and he said that the person who owned the... um, the venue had, you know, there's a lineup of comedians. The, the one who was just before him, who he was going to have to follow, was doing really, really well. And the person who ran the play said, oh, oh you know, Tom Segura, the comedian, he says, oh, you're going to do fine. You know, <laughs> you're going to do really well. And normally he wouldn't have to say that. But in this case, the guy was so nervous at having to follow the comedian who did well that he thought he better reassure the comedian. <laughs> So it's it's the same thing again, where normally there's no need for any kind of compliment or anything like that. Only when you have doubts is there that need. Right. It's interesting. But at the same time, sometimes one is being sincere in complimenting someone else. For example, if I enjoy a conversation with someone, I do tend to tell that person afterwards, hey, I really had fun talking to you because I think I think it's worth saying in the event that it's not obvious. Yeah, I guess it's a different thing. Like one is reassurance, the other is sort of a normal compliment. But yeah, like if right before you go onto the stage, somebody says, "Oh, you're going to do really well," uh, the assumption right. is that you're nervous and have another idea. Like the the reason that they're telling you that is because they think you think something different. By the way, uh, since you brought up, I'm a huge fan of uh, comedy and comedians, and actually, I'm a big fan of Tom Segura. His latest dance video is unbelievably hysterical. If you watch it, but first you have to watch. Well, Bert Kreischer made one, and then Tom Segura made a response video, but that's a whole other thing. But, uh, Indeed. Yeah, I, I'll send them to you for sure. It, they're pretty funny. No, I've seen because them both, they're yeah. so. They're, oh, you've seen them both? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you like them or no? Yeah, great stuff. Oh, hilarious. Hilarious. And, you know, I actually, they had a podcast where they talked about it, and this connects to critical rationalism. Bert Kreischer was saying that this is what comedy is all about, is that we're just playing. And I thought that's beautiful because uh, actually, if I may, you said that to me in a private conversation that, in fact, a lot of progress, whether scientific or economic or anything, in fact, does not come from the trade-off between play and work, but in fact, is a result of, of playing itself and having fun. Yeah, it's really interesting to think that uh, you can have a good life by having fun in the sense of like actually making progress, not just having entertainment. Yeah, I know that this comes up with there's a connection to effective altruism. Uh, here, which is interesting, and the idea of just generally trying to do good things in the world. And it's that there's this tension between the idea of doing things which you know will have good consequences and doing things for other reasons than that. Like, it seems like a good idea at the time, it's just fun, you know, I can't see any use in it necessarily right now, but something seems interesting about it. So yeah, so the, whether something is going to be have, have good consequences or interesting, and these are two different ways of deciding on things to do. And I recall going to... Um, UK and having a chat with some effective altruists and bring up that point that if you want to have, it almost sounds like a paradox, if you want to have the best consequences, or you want to do things that will have good consequences, many of those things you will not pursue if you only pursue things which you know to have good consequences. In other words, you know, you, you do something for fun and it turns out to solve cancer, but you couldn't have known that ahead, ahead of time. So before you knew it was going to solve cancer, there would have been no argument 
um, to say that it's going to be consequential. So if somebody said, tell me your plans for the next year and why those things and not other things will be very important. Well, you, you wouldn't be able to tell them anything. So you would have avoided the path that led to the cancer cure instead focusing on something which you knew the consequences of. And so if we follow that universally, that rule of doing only things whose consequences we need to be good, we would end up avoiding lots of things that in fact led to um, our present situation being good. So you can't apply that rule universally. You have to have this idea of doing things for other reasons than you know their consequences uh, to be good. Right, and that rule of doing things whose consequences, of doing only things whose consequences you know to be good is inherently anti-creative because it, it presumes to know the future. And moreover, I think that whole subculture of of applying that rule and following that rule is related to the perception that self-flagellation and self-sacrifice are virtues, which I completely disagree with. Because what if it's just the case that investing in a bunch of small companies, to sort of go back to the Bezos example, yields more prosperity than giving directly to charity? Now, the investing in a bunch of small companies, if that's successful, that will benefit you more, at least financially, than giving directly to charity. And yet, it just so happens that it could be that that also benefits other people more than giving to charity. So again, it's related to the fact that an economy is not a fixed pie and that just because you do something that might help you more than other actions, it still might be the most moral action to take. Yeah, like the point with the I was making with the effect of altruism was more like just to add one small note to that. It, it isn't that you should avoid doing things which are consequential or getting to charity or whatever. It's just that as a rule if everyone did it, things would go badly, is one of the way to put it, which is true of most things, really. I mean, if everybody did only things who consequences they didn't know to be good, well, that would cut out a lot of things that we kind of we have pretty good theories about doing such and such research or whatever will be a good idea. So the idea is that there are multiple ways of deciding on what to do, and no one of them should really uh, should be the only one. So that's really an argument for diversity more than anything else. But it is sort of highlighting a spot that uh, wasn't highlighted in that community, for instance. The focus was overwhelmingly to do things with good known consequences, which is fine, I, I think, to do part of the time. But um, yeah, if everyone did it all the time, that wouldn't be good. I wonder if maybe people should abide by some sort of creativity principle, that one should not abide by rules that limit creativity arbitrarily or something like that. I'm just sort of shooting from the hip here. Well, yeah, it's interesting that the idea that you would pursue different things for different reasons sounds very plausible and obvious when it's stated that way. But I recall being like in college and always thinking like, is there just an, like a certain algorithm I can follow, a certain self-help rule or whatever uh, that I would just solve my problems or allow me to or maybe not even solve all my problems but would be the best approach to solving the problems that came up and i was always frustrated to find that after a week or something whatever plan i had hatched would uh it would not work you know like waking up at a certain time or whatever it was uh didn't seem to uh give me all the benefits i had hoped from it and uh, i think that's generally true in the sense you mentioned like yeah like there's always gonna be new problems new things that are unpredictable so no approach you define now is going to really solve all of them. And the ideas that come up here, you know, as, a spe as a special case, um, you can't necessarily define one rule for what projects to pursue in the future, let's say. And so if you said only pursue things whose consequences are known and good, well, that, that, that limits you from certain things. Uh, whereas if you say, don't let me follow a principle, but let me just acknowledge that different things can be good for different reasons, just like different musical pieces can be good for different reasons. You know, one has the great guitar solos and the other has great violins and whatever, great melodies or harmonies. And they're not really comparable in that way. But when you hear them, you think, oh, there's something interesting here. Uh, I like this. And it may be, again, for a totally different reason than for every other piece of music you have also liked. So did over pro for projects. You, know, you have an idea for a project. You say, there's something good about this. I don't know what it is. But it's not that I can predict that it has a good impact that'll have a good impact on the world. And yet there's something 
interesting here. So let me try and pursue that a bit. So it's not really about following a rule, but sort of being open to assessing things on their own merits. Uh, and uh, this is also a good example of new ideas aren't just required for what new projects to do. Like you, you don't have ideas only about, you know, ah, oh, this would be a cool project. You also have new ideas about how to decide between projects. So there's this pair that Popper always talked about of conjectures and criticism. You have new ideas for projects, but also new ideas for how to criticize projects and how to compare them, decide between them. So I think both are necessary. Yes, the idea is that our modes of criticism themselves are subject to improvement. I think Deutsch mentions that in one of his books. And so I thought that was actually, to bring it back a little bit to, as you were saying, the conjecture and refutation core of critical rationalism. I thought that was the coolest thing. I don't remember if I first read it from Deutsch or Popper, that our modes of criticism can evolve. And that was when I first became open to the idea that criticizing just scientific theories, but then ideas more generally, is not just about refuting them via experiment. And that just opened up a whole world of ideas. Yeah, it's interesting that there's, uh, you know, there's as you say, experiment and argument, and, uh, and both have their place. Um, I, I guess it's interesting, like, I, I'm almost doing the reverse in a way, where uh, the thing which I, I, I'm getting to learn more about is sort of empirical testing, in the sense of doing things like in daily life. Like I remember... Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how much stock to put in this, but it was it was kind of fun to read. There was an article that said uh, the ten thousand hour rule states that you gain mastery after ten thousand hours in whatever pursuit you're you're after. But shouldn't we instead prefer the ten thousand experiment rule rather than the ten thousand hour rule? Uh, in the sense of saying, uh, let me not choose a direction and pursue it single mindedly for ten thousand hours, but instead try to try out ten thousand different things, you know, maybe on a single project or topic or whatever, but that that will be the thing that makes the difference. And so I think in personal life, that applies just as well, where you can say, well, uh, in some cases, I'll be able to think through something and predict what will happen, but in other cases not. And so the thing is to try it and to try it in a way that uh, is low risk and that allows you to try many experiments. And so if you are good at sort of doing these experiments, uh, the thing that will happen is that you can try many of them very easily and cheaply. As an aside, I, I did a, an undergrad in mechanical engineering, and one of the things that they said there in a the class was that as you get to be a more expert engineer, you can do do things more cheaply in the sense that like if you just begin, you don't really know how to analyze a situation, and then as you get better, you have more tools and more complex tools, and you may bring more complex models to bear on some problem. Because once you get really good, you know um, when those complex things aren't required, and so you can really easily analyze the situation with the simple model rather than some complex thing. And so I think something similar comes up with experimentation in daily life where you can say like, well, once you get good at it, you can try to understand or, or think of what is the simplest way I can try out this idea. And if I think that this career path or, or whatever, this project idea is good, what is the simplest way to test that you know, rapidly um, without investing $1,000 or whatever? How can I in the next hour figure out whether this is a good idea and whether I should pursue it some more? So I think that's a fun way to think. You know, more experiments, lower risk, this kind of thing. Was it John Wheeler who said our goal as scientists is to discover our mistakes as fast as possible? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I heard the yeah, quote. Yeah, I mean, that like... applies to, that's another yeah. sort of unification, I think, between scientific experimentation and just criticism of our conjectures and problem solving more generally. Yeah, yeah, and so I think not only do we want to discover our errors as quickly as possible, but going back to your engineering example, and I think Deutsch writes about this, is that basically we want to automate everything that's not creative. And I wonder if there's some sort of, uh, and here I'm really shooting from the hip, if there's some sort of, this. now we're switching topics of, a little bit, only because it's on my mind. Are you familiar with the idea of a universal constructor? Uh, at a high level, I think. A thing that can make anything. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about this this morning, actually. Once we have a universal constructor, or we've built one, how do we become wealthy? Like, is that just the beginning of of real economics? You know what I mean? Uh, I, I don't know how much... Like, uh, I mean, if you have a 3D printer, it will sometimes be cheaper to not use it, even though uh, it could make a thing. So... Um... You know, if you have a, a, a assembly line which is devoted to making only one thing, and it's known that 
you know, everybody wants this one thing. So it makes sense to set up a process which is efficient at making just that one thing. Um, and that may be preferable to the thing that the, the 3D printer, which could make it in principle, but would it would just be more costly per unit. Uh, so I think that um, to, to have... And the same is true of computers. We have general purpose computers. We also have sort of special purpose little chips that compute one small thing. And those are preferable in certain situations. So um, the, uh, there's a trade-off usually between generality on the one hand and um, sort of specific, so something being very tailored to one particular application. So that's always in the back of my mind when I think about, you know, what will change when you have a uh, universal constructor. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know how much will change in that sense. You'll still have to know what to tell it to make. Uh, so you, you can't necessarily, like, you, you won't make the thing, and then it'll just make everything that's useful for you without any further input. So, uh, yeah, I haven't given much thought to what would change once you had uh, sort of the ultimate 3D printer. But, um, yeah, do you have any thoughts? Not really. I mean, I just thought about it this morning, and I figured since I'm talking to you now, I figured I'd throw it at you. I definitely want to think about it more, though. Because I do have a sense that I just have a sense that there are, there's more to think about, I guess, is all I can, is all I can say. Sure. Because when you talk about trade-offs, I wonder if the trade-offs are rendered irrelevant once you have a universal constructor. Well, because if it can build anything, then it can build anything in any quantity given the right input. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that's cool about a, a general system like that, a universal system is that uh, you can put a lot of effort into optimizing that thing. If, everyone, if everyone's going to use it for everything, <laughs> potentially, uh, then there's a lot of value in making it better in any small way that you can. And that's true of computers. So now that everybody uses computers for everything, it has paid many people over the last decades to make computers better in any way they can. Make it more efficient to use them, make the hardware better, et cetera, et cetera. And an improvement made by anyone in any field to how to program a computer can be spread pretty widely as a result. Um, because we know that, yeah, this insight into some esoteric algorithm and how to analyze astronomical data, if you can figure out how to do that faster, sometimes that has consequences for algorithms that uh, are used in biology or something. Or if you have a computer which you design the hardware to be very fast at some kind of thing, um, sometimes that'll be useful uh, to many, many different people. So the same could be true of this uh, of universal constructor where, you know, Anybody making anything at any time could come up with an improvement to it that then spreads to everybody, which would be very cool, which isn't necessarily so true today, though something similar happens with manufacturing techniques generally. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you had one system that, you know, any one improvement by anybody would help everybody, that's pretty cool. And that would give you a reason to expect it to improve pretty rapidly. I guess I need to do more inf research into the universal constructor because my only hesitation would be, man, maybe it's semantics that if you're ca if it's capable of capable of being improved, then that maybe implies that before the improvement, it wasn't a universal constructor in the first place because it wasn't capable of rendering any possible input to output transformation. But I don't want to go too far into that because that could be a semantic difference or maybe not. I'd have to read into it. Well, I but mean, it's fun you, to think about for sure. You can also add the idea of at a certain cost. You know, you, you can make X, but it requires the whole GDP of the world to make it. Well, okay, that's not, mm. not so good. But then, or or it could take longer than the whole universe's age. Yeah. So the the speed and cost, let's say even just like something objective, like not even to do with cash, which is like energy cost uh, mm. of doing something, uh, could be improved. So yeah, that every that everything that can be made in principle can be made with the thing is one fact about it, but then the other parameters as well. And the same is true of computers. It's fun to think about the universal constructor because it's almost literally a genie in a bottle that's allowed by the laws of physics. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. But, right. Well, it's not actual, but that's the point. And this goes back to Deutsch's principle of optimism is that it almost allows you to think not magic, because magic is by definition impossible, but if you think about anything at all, anything as fantastical as you can imagine, if it's not forbidden by the laws of nature, then it is just a matter of knowing how to do it. Yeah. I mean, that really opens up the imagination. Yeah, I think it does. And it, it changes how, how one views one's ideas in a way. Like you, I think it makes one less dis dismissive when one has an idea about, you know, it could... 
<laughs> so this is one of the things I describe to people when I recommend David's book uh, is to say that, that the title you know describes a world where progress uh, never has to end, and even when our civilization is as you know in a million years hence when uh, you know toddlers are playing with black holes as if they were the firecrackers, you know there'll still be uh, lots more to do. Uh, they'll still just be at the beginning. That, that's a really evocative image. And so I think, yeah, like, uh, yeah, but of course, when you say toddlers playing with black holes like they're, you know, fireworks, uh, that can happen, can it? So it's, I don't see a reason why I couldn't. You say, okay, well. Exactly. <laughs> and that turns out to be kind of a, a knockdown argument in a way. Yes, I, I've told a few people. I try to, ex- actually, I've told, because Thanksgiving just passed, I remember, I always tell my family. I try to explain to them that there's no such thing as an idea that they cannot understand, given that the idea is comprehensible, that we're all universal explainers, and then I also try to explain to them the principle of optimism, and they just tell me I'm wrong. Like They just, they're like, I don't believe you. So I think a lot of it is just, frankly, people's intuitions will resist a lot of these ideas, and that's what we're fighting against, I think. Yeah, I think in that particular case... I remember somebody telling me, oh, you're a programmer. I could never do that. And uh, I said I, I said to him something like, well, you, you say that, but you don't really believe it. What you're actually saying is I would not care to spend the time that it requires to be good at that. <laughs> uh, I like, I'm, not, I'm not interested enough to do what you do is what you're actually saying, right? He says, yeah, you're, you're probably right. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm going to start using that. Okay, I, I think we've covered this topic plenty. We've given the listeners a good taste of optimism and critical rationalism and how it can apply to problems and, and creativity and life. And so I very much appreciate your time, Carlos. Uh, if the listener wants to read more about these general ideas, what books or essays would you recommend? Well, there's the obvious ones. Uh, David's books, The Beginning of Infinity, Fabric of Reality, which are always fun. Yeah, I, I mentioned Peter Thiel's uh, Zero to One, was kind of a fun read. And it's sort of the closest I've come to something which seems like David's books, you know, on optimism, you know, in some other context, in this case in business. I don't know that everything is so relevant to somebody who is interested in, you know, David's books, for instance, but there's some overlap there. And yeah, I don't know if I can recommend it just yet, but I think I'll be able to recommend it. I'm currently reading a book called The Lunar Men, which uh, is about, I guess, uh, the Age of Enlightenment and the, the folks... Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, a group of friends who, who made quite a lot of progress uh, just by pursuing their own interests and sharing their ideas. So uh, that's something I look forward to. But yeah, I think that's my recommendations. I definitely want to read that book, actually, because if I may say so, you had mentioned it to me privately. The other thing I just recalled is I'm also reading some more um, Ian Banks culture novels. Those are always fun. I think sci-fi is a nice way of uh, sort of getting optimism sort of in a roundabout way like you're you're not directly seeing the arguments but you're seeing sort of a civilization in the sci-fi world that uh looks at all the problems of today as being you know things of the past so they're not worried about you know even money or something necessarily but uh or you know food and shelter they're thinking about oh yeah how do we build some ultra awesome uh space habitat that's you know a thousand times bigger than any planet or whatever it is so you sort of get a yeah i think that there is a way of looking at things that as a result of, uh, yeah, rereading David's book, let's say. But then there's also this idea of, yeah, I, oh, I just read a bunch of sci-fi. And so that you look at things differently as a result. It allows you to look at our present problems as if you had hindsight. Yeah, it just ch- changes the context of things. Like when you just, yeah, we're reading about somebody creating a planet or destroying a star or doing whatever they're doing. It sort of uh, gives you... That uh, thing which some people accuse uh, Elon Musk of having this reality distortion feel, like, oh, that he thinks he can do anything. Well, when you read sci-fi, you sort of feel the same way. You feel like, oh, well, yeah, start a rocket company. That doesn't seem like, that seems actually kind of pitiful compared to what these guys are doing in this book. So it changes, it changes your idea of what's normal, what seems rational to try to do. Yeah, because your your sights are set so much higher by the technical capabilities of the people you're reading about. Right, and that reminds me, one of the reasons I value learning about history and the history of civilization and the history of ideas so much is that we already are a sci-fi, we basically already are someone's idea of a sci-fi novel from a few hundred years ago. 
had there been such a genre. Yeah. But it doesn't feel well, that way to the, in the present, so... <laughs> but <laughs> that's the, the problem. To, yeah. It is that way. Yeah. Uh, as an aside, uh, um, I read part of, at least, um, Steven Pinker's book on uh, on progress. I guess it's his most recent, recent one, I think. But... Um, it has a really cool section in it at the, towards the beginning, and it lists out all the beliefs that said like of Englishmen at like the turn of the Industrial Revolution or whatever, you know, sometime during that period. And it's kind of shocking to look back at what people used to think. And you know, he makes the point that totally. this was sort of the more advanced, you know, the, the, like this wasn't somebody in the woods in some you know primitive society. This was like the most advanced people at the time had these ideas, and it's it's things like you know witches sink ships and. I mean, crazy stuff. You think, wow. I mean, it's, it's only my ignorance of history, which leads me to think that you know, they thought like I do. And not because I'm so special, but just because that, that, that's common sense now, uh, that witches don't sink ships. But the best people, you know, the best thinkers at the time, <laughs> it seems, or the common Englishman or something, like, like I think he makes the point, had those ideas. You think, wow. Okay, well, once you see what they actually thought back then, you get a much more visceral sense of how far we come. Absolutely. It's both humbling and inspiring simultaneously to learn just how many errors were in our ancestors' worldview. Yeah, I guess humbling in the sense that we're probably the same in our own way. In, you know, in the sense that we have all kinds of errors that we don't know about and will be kind of laughable in the future. Carlos, thank you very much for joining me on the Fallible Animals podcast. It was a lot of fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. Happy to chat. Thanks. All right. Take care. Adios. If you value what we're doing here on the Fallible Animals podcast, please consider donating to the show. I recently set up a Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash fallible animals. I very much appreciate your support, and it inspires me to continue to spread these ideas, whether through podcasts or articles. Uh.